Anonymous? Yes, sir. Shall we start? Or? Uh, start, start, start. Okay, okay. A good morning, a very good morning to all. Uh, welcome to the second day of this special lecture series, particularly designed for UG semester three and semester five, organized by the, the Department of English, KK Dash College, in collaboration with the IQAC KK Dash College, and of course, in association with various other evening colleges. Today, we have among us our principal of KK Dash College, Dr. Ramkrishna Prashad Chakraborty, our guest of honor, Dr. Rajasri Yogi, Honorable Principal of Vijayagar College, our inaugurator, Professor Piyas Chakraborty, Bagnan College, and of course our speaker, Professor Shuhankar Ghosh Rai Choudhury, Rai Dihi College. Um, before further proceeding, I'd like to request our principal to kindly welcome our guest and to say a few words. Over to you, sir. Good morning, my dear students and our guest, inaugurator, and of course, today's speaker. Today is the first day for the semester five students. And the platform is made for the students only across West Bengal. A classroom is created, perhaps a new concept in West Bengal. Students from different colleges will come, enter into the classroom, and at the same time, teachers on different college will deliver their lecture to Google Meet. And the le recorded lecture will be given in the classroom. So my dear student, go through the classroom, take the link from there. And if you are benefited from this classroom, then I can think that our attempt has made its success. So, thank you for being with this classroom and also in this Google Meet. Now, may I request Dr. Raju Siniyogi, my colleague principal of Yoyagar Jyotish Rai College, who is present today as guest of honor, to say a few words. Good morning. I'm really uh, feeling honored uh, to be here. Thank you, sir. Uh, myself, Dr. Rajasthan Yogi, Principal Bijagar Jyotishra College, would like to welcome all the students, teachers, and students' uh, speaker in this uh, session. Also, I would like to congratulate KK Dash College. Uh, for organizing such a wonderful venture, for initiating such a wonderful uh, venture. As all we know and still experiencing that our life is stuck by the pandemic, but we cannot afford to forget our commitment towards student community. We, can, we are earnestly trying to reach to our students, at least virtually. Keeping in this mind, Kekadas College has initiated this wonderful venture by using online platform. This college is trying to bring number of good teachers in this field directly to the students virtually so that they can enrich themselves. I hope that this venture may be a milestone in the effective teaching learning process. Also, I hope that this session will be very interesting. I wish all the success for this wonderful iconic venture. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. One second, welcome all. Thank you, Rajasri. 
for your encouraging speech. My dear student, you are physically at a distance from us, but you are not mentally detached from us. And that we want to establish here through this classroom and this web live online platforms. Now, I would like to request Piyash Chakraborty, who has planned the series of lectures, who helped enormously to me in this direction to inaugurate the session of semester five lectures. Yes. Good morning. You see, when Dr. Ramakrishna Pusha Chakraborty approached me for the first time with this proposal, you know, it stuck a very important chord in my vein, in my, in my mind, because I realized that this is exactly the need of the hour. A teacher is only complete when he is able to communicate with his students. We are there for you. And although as teachers, we have been attending series of webinars, this venture of trying to connect the teacher and the students of different colleges is in keeping with the UGC guideline of faculty exchange program also. This is a novel venture and I'm sure it will be a grand success. Now, today is the first lecture in the fifth semester series. And so, without much ado, I request Dr. I request Shupankar Ghosh Rai Choudhury of Rai Digi College to deliver his lecture on T.S. Eliot's Preludes. It is an iconic poem. It talks about the, the modern man's predicament. And I have a feeling that through this lecture, he will be able to reconnect us with the present condition and also give us an idea about how T.S. Eliot's thinking can play a central role in, in understanding the world around us. Without much ado, I now request Shubankar Ghosh Rai Choudhury to deliver his lecture. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Am I audible to all? Yes, yes. Shubankar Rai Choudhury is from Rai Digi College, our linkage partner in the quality, imparted in quality education in the map of our spender. They are in a linkage with us. So it is the time for Shubankar from Rai Digi College. Department of English, anybody is Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, sir. I believe I'm audible to everyone. Uh, Completely audible, no problem. So, okay, okay. Your, your uh, microphone was a problem, great problem, a few minutes back. Uh, yes, now yes, you are yes. audible. Okay. okay. Um, I thank uh, Dr. Ramakrishna Chakraborty, the principal of KP Das College, the Department of English. KK Das College and all the other organizers for you know allowing me this opportunity to speak to the students. Uh, before I start, uh, just a couple of words to my students. Uh, first, uh, uh, just uh, uh, try to refrain from uh, sharing your screen because uh, a PowerPoint presentation will be going on. So every time someone shares his or her screen, it will be a delay in the whole procedure. Uh, and uh, secondly, uh, while listening to the discussion, if you feel like asking a question uh, or sharing your observation, rather than waiting for your turn to ask them at the end of the lecture, uh, in case uh, we run short of time, uh, you can just drop your queries in the chat box here uh, in the Google Meet so that when I end my lecture, I can find them and answer them one by one. Uh, so I'll be just uh, sharing my presentation and um, let us see if it works. Uh, is it visible? To yes, you? yes, 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 yes. Okay, sir. Okay. So, uh, 
I'll be speaking on T.S. Eliot's Preludes, uh, one of his early creations. Uh, you know, before he became the T.S. Eliot in 1922 with the publication of The Wasteland. Uh, now, to begin with, uh, it goes without saying that a one hour span is never really enough to discuss a literary work in its entirety. Uh, so we won't be that ambitious here. Uh, instead, let us try to assess this poem written in the early decades of the vast and checkered field of the 20th century uh, in the light of its time. <clears throat> you see many literary endeavors are there out, uh, which outlive their times and become classics, evolving with the changing generations of readers. Yet at the same time, one can never really deny that these works at the very core were products of their own time. There is absolutely nothing unnatural about it, uh, that things always live uh, in two different planes at once. Mm -hmm. uh, number one, what they actually were, and Number two, what they are becoming. Hence, uh, though the fact that uh, we are reading Eliot's Preludes 100 years down the line is a proof itself of its classic nature, uh, we should also not overlook its origin and the impacts uh, that made it what it is. Uh, so you have already seen the title slide of my presentation. It bears the subtitle, Broken Tales from Modern Times. Uh, the stress being deliberately on the element of time. Uh, and the broken tales part highlights a major feature uh, of that particular time. You might say one of many truths uh, of the 20th century. Uh, today, our journey will be uh, about the exploration of the truth through this poem to understand that preludes often underrated in the face of the, uh, what should I call it, magnanimity of the wasteland or the hollow man is actually a significant representative of, of the modern age. Uh, so I have divided our journey um, for some one and a half hour uh, into two parts. The first part is called the context, which to me is extremely crucial to our understanding of any literary work, not only preludes. So it is about analyzing the predominant currents of the time upon which the work is based. Uh, if we have a very basic awareness of the interrelation between history and different art forms, uh, we will quickly realize that no work of art or no age exists in vacuum. The present always bears number one, watermarks of the past, and number two, the possibilities for the future. I think there is a disruption here. Someone shared his or her screen. Just a moment. I think it's visible again. So we were here. Uh, uh, we were saying that the present always bears the watermarks of the past and the possibilities for the future at once. Hence, to understand um, the 20th century premises upon which Eliot developed his preludes, uh, we need to go back a little and see how all these evolved. Only then the work would start carrying considerable meaning to us. So we start our journey 
you often come across such words and phrases as you see these words fragmented disoriented broken identity crisis anxiety split personality all sorts of heavy words uh, in relation to the modern age but have we really given it a thought that uh, why all of a sudden these words these terms uh, start appearing as we move from the victorian period to the modern period uh we mostly use these words while writing answers you see uh, just because they were there in the history of literature books and critical editions and class notes uh, and eventually we make a habit of using them at any given opportunity uh, without even realizing that uh, this is what is called term dropping uh, so first thing first uh, before we uh, bombard our examiners with these terms let us understand the weight of these uh, which will eventually lead us to the modern age and preludes uh, so i am going back uh, in time uh, to the early part of the victorian period when the industrial revolution had just started taking a gigantic shape in england in the 1830s uh, to make these city based factories which were propping up uh, now and then at that point of time uh to make these run smoothly the owners and investors needed manpower uh and for that they approached whom the peasant community in the countryside uh now just uh, listen to this story here is a very beautiful story that starts off with once upon a time like a fairy tale so once upon a time uh, this peasant community was living an unassuming life in the countryside of england yes there were uncertainties of an agrarian lifestyle the weather played a big part not always you know were their incomes steady and decent but something was very unique about them you know there was a very strong community bonding despite these uncertainties you see small villages limited number of families all knowing one another by names earning their own meager meals in a decent grounded way these played a part in keeping them content more or less however when the city based factory owners lured these people with a promise of a better income and a better life if they join the factories as workers as laborers these village folks just could not ignore the prospects of of the glittering urban hence started uh, a big migration of peasants from the villages to the cities in the hope of an attractive living but again uh, as always promises are made to be broken the purposes of the factories were served no doubt uh with peasants joining as laborers in numbers but the promised better livings were uh, were only rooms with extreme space crunch slums many heads living uncomfortably under one small roof and the promised better income what about that it was often insufficient for a family to run even a single day so let us just spare a moment for these people and think what they had lost really number 1 all their securities they had left behind in their villages uh, like their private small homes their unassuming but sufficient income etc number 2 coming to the cities they missed more or less everything that was promised and add to this there was the loss of a familiar circle you remember we were talking of uh, these strong community bonding it comes from that the comfort and assurance that comes from knowing one another by name by face was lost now in big cities living poorly and helplessly these people were victims of anonymity nobody knew them they could share their pain to no one 
so not only in terms of financial or social security but also on very personal grounds they these people were alienated anxiety and an ensuing identity crisis gradually crept in you know much later uh, we are talking uh, about a time around boys first decade 20th century we will find a brilliant expression of this deep personal crisis in one of Ezra Pound's imagist poem you must have heard his name Ezra Pound one of the forerunners of the modernism movement uh, the poem was in a station of the metro it reflects this crisis let us go through the poem first the apparition of these faces in the crowd petals on a wet black bow that's it that is the whole poem just a two liner saying a world of things and note the extent of the crisis of the anonymity that faces in the crowd are like apparitions as if they they have no real existence so to say and how do they look like petals on a wet black bow just as in a bow you see the flowers collectively as a mass and do not really care for reach and every petal so are these people like petals present yet unnoticed indistinct seen as a mass with no distinct face like an apparition so moving on from this point um, though the so called lower class of the society was directly affected by this industrial boom the other classes remained content in their uh, small bubbles with high moral values faith in religious doctrines and a strong belief a pride in the supremacy of their nation and race and then came the year 1859 and a book was published we enter into the stage 2 of this disease the field of science was making considerable progress uh, and the scientist charles darwin established his theory of evolution in his book the origin of species this is obviously the shortened title uh, you can find the original title on internet always uh, so this book the origin of species did not only made a leap in terms of scientific research you see but it shook the whole society to its very roots the idea of the divine chain of being that was so religiously propagated by the ecclesiastical sector the churches to the pious believers uh, over the centuries the faith that made man believe that he was a direct descendant of god on earth was completely turned on their heads the darwinian theory of evolution established the fact that man evolved merely from the apes and not from god however normal it seems to us today it wasn't so in the victorian society the position of the all powerful overseeing god who provided men with reason for existence justice and reward for their morality was not only questioned but god was simply demolished no other scientific theory in the past had challenged and refuted god with such disdain with this unforeseen vacuum in this religious level a large section of the society was deeply wounded and affected and a crisis in faith ensued the ideas that were age old taken for granted such as righteousness justice morality particularly divine justice 
made no sense, absolutely no sense whatsoever. The benevolence upon which men had depended for, for all these years now was suddenly an orphan. And in a godless world, the inability to restore faith further aggravated the anxiety and disorientation of fixities of this age. Now, as if these two crises were not enough, a third awaited its turn in the political scenario, the stage three of this disease. Just as man as an individual and God's descendant uh, well, was losing his singular certainty, identity, as a nation and as a race, England's supremacy, raging pride in their imperial project of acquiring supremacy over other countries also suffered a setback during these years. In the Eastern Front, uh, we know the Indians had already started launching protests and attacks against the British oppression since the time of the 1857 mutiny. Others countries too gradually stood up against the empire. And I would like to mention here particularly the Boer War, uh, which was fought between the empire and the Boer Republic of South Africa from 1899 to 1902. The empire won eventually this war, but it was considered by many and most importantly by some figures closely associated uh, with the British bureaucracy, it was a shallow victory. So the British Empire was coming to terms with the fact that its glorious run was coming to an inevitable way now. In its condition, one, one finds an echo of the famous lines you must have read uh, by W.B. Yeats, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. The first great war was at hand at the turn of the century. It was a decade of impending gloom, anxiety, depression. The modern age, the 20th century, had at last, had finally arrived. Already, it was still new, still young, but already shredded into individual, religious, and political crisis. Uh, before we proceed further, uh, here is a small confusion that uh, we need to resolve first. Uh, so we have just mentioned that uh, the modern age had arrived. Now, why do we call 20th century the modern age, even after 120 years in 2020? Uh, modern, uh, as we understand, it refers to something that is current or present or contemporary. Then why do we tag an age past with this word? The answer to this puzzle is the sense of the word modern for the 20th century actually stretches beyond its regular meaning. The modern age owes its name to a term used by the famous French poet of the mid 19th century, Charles Baudelaire. In his book, the painter of modern life, Baudelaire uses this term, modernity. Uh, and uh, what did he mean by this term? Uh, he wanted to define the radically new ways of living which followed the Industrial Revolution. Please note that modernity has a broader denotative meaning if we open up a dictionary. But I am talking of a connotation, here, right? Uh, for Baudelaire, modernity referred to a lifestyle that was at complete break with its wholesome, peaceful, moral, proud past. It was marked by all the negative impacts we have discussed up to this point. So therefore, modern age was a time when mm, the ways of modernity were at their peak and you must remember that an art generated at that time or an artist representing that time is therefore called a modernist art or a modernist artist. 
therefore always remember one can always be modern in relation to his or her own age right like uh, charles dickens was modern uh, in the victorian period chaucer was modern in the middle ages alexander pope was modern in the augustan age age so uh, it's easy to be modern in your time but that does not mean that that person he or she is a modernist that is why when we call t s eliot a modernist or preludes a modern poem we don't mean the denotative sense of the term modern but its connotative sense uh so now let us go back to those heavy words you remember uh, that we were using at the beginning rather habitually uh let us now reassess and place those words uh in the salient features um, of the of the age we have managed to deduce uh so if you are asked to cut this fairly long story short and mention uh, the elements that made the 20th century stand apart from its predecessor the high sounding moral progressive industrious victorian age what would be the points you must mention the distinguishing characteristics of the modern age carved by these three major crises were number 1 disintegration uh, of prevalent value system and morality then obviously comes the disoriented understanding of a time that has or that had its securities at stake also with the crumbling down of major social religious political pillars no view of life could now be considered self sufficient and absolute the society as well as man started acknowledging multiple realities you see and multiple personalities every certainty seemed fleeting and transient also we must uh, keep in mind that Uh, these ideas of multiple or split personalities were further brought into prominence following a remarkable uh, development in the field of psychology and psychoanalysis thanks to sigmund freud and william james also let us not forget uh, the political supremacy the solid morality uh, the glory of enlightenment everything uh, every aspect of glory turned inglorious in the face of insecurities and anxieties so now we have our uh, heavy terms properly placed and hopefully understood uh, in the modern age therefore uh, we mostly see works uh, that explicitly or in recluse uh, mourn the lost heritage and pride the modern age despite all its artistic brilliance upholds only a series of anticlimaxes that had stained europe's and particularly england's ego look around and you will find such moments in literature in abundance high grave words depicting a pathetic condition or building up a climax only to smash it into dust really who can forget the end of t s eliot's the hollow men for three times uh, he says this is the way the world ends this is the way the world ends this is the way the world ends and after that he comes up with what not with a bang but a whimper you see this miserable world is not blessed to have a bang at the end but it will end in a whimper or let us say the beginning of another of his early classics the love song of j alfred truffrock which you will be reading in this semester only uh it begins with a traditional romantic tone let us go then you and i when the evening is spread out against the sky and then comes uh the greatest of all anticlimaxes a short simple simile like a patient etherized upon a table now we can really see how the things that were meant to be for all these days were falling apart that the center could not really hold the disjointed pieces together as one unified whole 
It is here we meet our text in question, prelims. So we move into the second section of our discussion. Uh, to approach the text, let us first see the title, not the title of the poem, preludes. It's a term, you know, borrowed from the field of music. And how do we define preludes in a musical piece? Roughly, uh, they are short introductory compositions on a specific theme, setting up the tone for what is to come next. Eliot, in his early days, uh, was a great admirer of the Polish composer, Frederick Chopin. And uh, one might as well presume um, that Chopin's preludes inspired Eliot to entitle his poem after this term. But in all the other respects, Eliot's poem acts rather as a contradiction, an antithesis to the romantic preludes of Chopin. It certainly, like Chopin, does set up the tone for the tunes to come, but what tunes are they really? Tunes generating from modern urban experiences in all their unromantic squalor, monotony, and horror. Uh, you see, be it in the graphic portrait of the sad, dingy aspects of modern city life through images, or the meaningless Russian clamor of the daily rounds, or the pathetic emptiness of human soul and the world outside. All these key notes are struck in the four preludes here. Eliot's, this poem, Preludes, foretells a bleak time that was embarking on its invasion. Let us see which time it was. If we, try, if we try finding out uh, the date of composition of preludes, we see that it was written in parts, each of the parts written in different time at different places. The first section of, of preludes, in fact, the first two sections, I must say, uh, were composed in October 1910 at Harvard, uh, then part three, in July 1911 at Paris and part four again in Harvard after November 1911 or possibly in 1912. Hence the complete poem framed between 1910 and 12 depicted a society that had all but lost its glory. One final nail on its coffin was uh, yet to come down in the form of the First World War in 1914. All the losses that were piling up for the last 70 or 80 years would eventually explode in this great war. And uh, in fact, the situation uh, would further worsen uh, beyond one's imagination. In fact, uh, standing at an age which runs on the wheels of wars here and there every day, we can only dare to imagine the gigantic blow with which the First World War came to greet human civilization. Uh, you know, the, there is an absolutely breathtaking passage uh, on the impact of this war in the historian Eric Hobsbawm's book, uh, The Age of Extremes. I would just like to read that short part to you uh, to make these things more familiar. Uh, I think it's visible, uh, the page. Uh, if it's not, then just listen to uh, what I'm reading from this, uh, or you can put your phones in the landscape mode and try seeing it. Uh, so this is from the book, The Age of Extremes, and from the chapter, The Age of Total War. It begins with this. The lamps are going out all over Europe, said Edward Grey, Foreign Secretary of Great Britain, as he watched the lights of Whitehall on the night when Britain and Germany went to war in 1940. 
we shall not see them lit again in our lifetime just note the dramatization how he dramatizes this whole situation in vienna the great satirist karl kraus prepared to document and denounce that war in an extraordinary reportage drama of 792 pages to which he gave the title the last days of humanity both saw the world war as the end of a world and they were not alone it was not the end of humanity although there were moments just follow the underlying parts although there were moments when the end of a considerable proportion of the human race did not look far off there were surely times when the god or gods whom pious humans believed to have created the world and all in it might have been expected to regret having done so the bleak black humor of hobsbawm mankind survived nevertheless the great edifice of 19th century civilization crumpled in the flames of world war as its pillars collapsed there is no understanding of the short 20th century without it it was marked by war it lived and thought in terms of world war even when the guns were silent and the bombs were not exploding for those who had grown up before 1914 the contrast was so dramatic that many of them refused to see any continuity with the past peace meant before 1914 after that came something that no longer deserved the name and again in relation to this uh, i am also reminded of uh, robindranath tagore's last long essay crisis in civilization বাংলায় যেটাকে আমরা সভ্যতার সংকট বলে জানি দো দা এসি ওয়াজ রিটেন ডিউরিং দা টাইম অফ দা সেকেন্ড ওয়ার্ল্ড ওয়ার টেগোর্স ওয়ার্ডস কুড অ্যাজ ওয়েল বি ফেল্ট ইন দা কনটেক্সট অফ দা আর্লি পার্ট অফ দা 20th সেঞ্চুরি ইন দা কনক্লুডিং পার্ট অফ দ্যাট এসে টেগোর সেজ আই এম কোটিং টেগোর আই হ্যাড এট ওয়ান টাইম বিলিভড দ্যাট the springs of civilization would issue out of the heart of europe but today when i'm when i am about to leave this world that faith has deserted me i look around and see the crumbling ruins of a proud civilization strewn like a vast heap of futility his argument of course takes an unforeseen turn from here and it was only possible for a figure like tagore uh, you see uh, who had seen two great wars in his lifetime and a number of personal tragedies and political unrest to still utter and yet i shall not commit the grievous sin of losing faith in man it is here that tagore had transcended while europe had failed miserably it had lost faith in god faith in man faith in humanity and ts eliot's poem is a prelude to all these now coming back to the text uh, if we look closely into the four sections of the poem uh, we can further find two clusters the first two sections can be read as a cluster that is more object centric talking of an evening and morning cityscape respectively the third and the fourth se- fourth section fourth part uh, if read in a cluster are relatively more subject centric focusing on two distinct individuals a woman in a brothel and a street lying across the cityscape yet uh, no matter how different they are from one another uh, they stick to a single theme eventually uh, the degeneration of or in city life uh we go through the sections now briefly uh not line by line obviously but let us rather focus on what are the major takeaways for us from each of the sections uh the first section uh is like 
a director's camera panning across the whole city of London, let us say, with one shot getting dissolved into the other. It makes a winter evening all the more gloomy, desolate, and melancholy by the gusty shower which soaks the withered leaves and waste papers. The line burnt out ends of smoky days, broadly comparing uh, a waning day to a burnt cigarette butt, uh, relates itself uh, with a kind of death in life existence of the cityscape, bereft of its vitality. Also, one can never miss the image of a fatigued, lonely cab horse. All these images, uh, in the first section, the ones we have mentioned, along with uh, the smell of steep, passageways, vacant lots, broken blinds, chimney pots, whatever you have, together form a mood, an emotion, out of this grim, gloomy realities and experiences of the city life. And we take this opportunity, of course, uh, also to remember that this concept uh, of a series of images giving rise to a particular emotion was famously termed by Eliot as objective correlative. Please remember this. You will come across this term more and more frequently in future. So here remains a nice, easy example of this apparently difficult concept, objective correlative for you. Uh, in the second section, again, uh, we have a picture of the cityscape in a dull, indifferent morning. Just consider the value of morning, of a new day, of the sun rising in the literature of the previous ages, particularly in the romantic poems. And now consider this, grossly unromantic. The city, the city morning is all about realities and daily business. It has nothing new to offer to its people. It starts off with faint, stale smells of beer. And gradually you come to realize that the muddy feet, you remember from the poem, that move to the coffee stands are no better in their living than the slum dwellers in their low grinding lives. The image of sawdust trampled street too is somewhat layered, you see, for for the word trampled almost signifies a sort of physical abuse, a suffering. Even when Eliot uses a word like masquerades, so to say, uh, to represent the other inhabitants of the place, there is an obvious sarcasm uh, that man is uh, no more living his own life. Instead, they are performing or enacting the act of living, like machines and robots. You see how in the backdrop of war and degeneration, Eliot deliberately, uh, what should I say, erases the, the holistic view and beauty of life. Time and again in this poem, he uses human body parts, like feet, hands, eyes, fingers, etc., to represent a person as if amidst these chaos, the human figure is also segregated and disconnected, dissociated from one's own self. Now, uh, you can see the name of two poems on your screen. Uh, I'll give you the reason behind this. When you are reading Eliot, you will always find him inspired by and alluding to some literature from the past. Uh, when you'll be reading proof rock, these tendencies will show up more frequently in the wasteland. Oh my God, the whole poem uh, at one level appears to be a tribute to all the past literary and philosophical traditions uh, covering Europe as well as the East. Preludes in this respect is quite original, honestly. Uh, however, we must not forget to mention that these evening and morning cityscapes uh, in the first two sections of preludes are deeply influenced in their presentation by Charles Baudelaire, you remember, the writer of, the painter of modern life, uh, who coined the term modernity, 
so uh, his poems the evening twilight and the morning twilight from the book the flowers of evil uh, these are of course titles um, of the english translation of the original french poems uh so now as we move to the latter half of the poem there is a greater complexity of tone and feeling all the so called actions are presented here by the poet makes the central inaction of life more prominent this particular prelude the third one that is gives an account of a prostitute who in a half awakened state thinks of the sordid images that she had experienced last night the utterly clumsy appearances of the room and and the lady are are only micro representations of the general edgy hollow modern existence the expressions such as uh, you see sparrows in the gutters or yellow souls uh, of feet or of soiled hands uh intensify the gloom and detestable atmosphere also as you go through the section you see it is not as simple in its expression uh, as the first two sections were uh, that a poetic voice is narrating some moments there is a deliberate mystification of the quote unquote you who is referred to here it is at once the poetic voice narrating the account of the lady and yet at the same time the visions that follow are associated to the lady's consciousness more than that of the poet and to complicate it further there is this all crucial expression you had such a vision of the street as the street hardly understands all of a sudden apart from the poetic voice and the lady's consciousness this street out of nowhere is endowed with a mind of its own which participates in the act of understanding the woman's wish though fails this striking reference to the street as a separate persona leads us to the final section of our poem uh when we come to the fourth section uh the hint that was provided previously mm, about the mind of the street now comes to reality as we see the transitory show of uh, fingers newspapers and eyes constituting the soul of a personified street if we look into the reservoir of bengali literature just to digress for a moment uh, such a tendency to bestow human characteristics upon an inanimate object and make it the thread bearer of a narrative is nothing very new in fact level on literature if you if we remember our school days uh, there used to come essays like ekti boyer attokotha or ekti adhuli attokotha and so on and why in the field of literature you just have to turn to golpo gucho uh, and you find their ghater kotha a short story Uh, i think the first story uh the ghat here assume, assumes uh the moods and features of its dwellers and yet have a distinct voice of its own to narrate a tale concerning two people similarly uh the fourth prelude here basically assumes what we might call ekti rajpather attokotha uh much like the ghat uh we have just referred to the street masks the hidden human reality now at this point there are several questions that come to us let us first take them what is this reality that it masks does the street have a face does it have have a separate face or a character of its own no had a separate face been there the poet wouldn't have bothered to bring in all these bits and pieces of images uh, you know to instill life in the street but then there are so many people uh, walking over and across that street 
if the street starts to assume each and everyone's identity or a part of it at least are those its truth so there are so many questions let us stop here for a moment uh, enough of this heavy discussions uh, you just relax and let me tell you a story now uh, it comes from our own uh, classical sanskrit literary tradition is the story of raja jonok we all know him uh, to be a very famous character so uh, it happened so that one night uh, king jonok was sleeping peacefully in his room when suddenly the sentinel came and uh, cried out maharaj uh, the enemies have attacked the city get up now we need to fight them so the king got up instantly wore his armors took his sword and left for the battle the opponent king was equally powerful uh, if not more and in that fierce battle jonok was defeated he was tied down insulted and dragged to the feet of the new king this new king says uh, to jonok as you were a king i will not kill you but you have to leave this state at once so jonok um, has no other way uh, tired and insulted he starts leaving his kingdom not a single soul in his state offered him food or water in this journey because they were afraid of the new king after walking for some 2 days jonok reached the end of his previous kingdom uh, and entered a neighboring state uh, so there was this uh, abhandara uh, what we call food and water was being served uh, and there was a long queue for those uh, jonok stood there like a common man uh, but again when his turn came by that time the there was no food left so jonok was extremely hungry and tired and on the verge of collapsing so this man who was serving food told jano uh, i have only a little starch left in the pot uh, do you want it jano accepted it and as he was about to have it a kite from nowhere came down and snatched it and flew away jano could not just take it any more he broke down fell on the ground and started wailing just at this moment he hears his sentinel speaking what happened maharaj why are you wailing in sleep so jono woke up to find that it was a nightmare but so real appeared that dream uh, that he was still shivering you know trembling and could only ask now note this question that jono asks he asked is this the truth that i am awake right now or was that the truth that means the dream the sentinel obviously uh, did not understand a penny of this uh, so he called for the queen then for the ministers and then the courtiers to all jonok simply kept asking this is this the truth or was that the truth nobody could answer because for obvious reason they didn't know what was that quote unquote that which jonok was talking about so days passed and jonok could not do any work and only kept asking this question throughout his days then some day a sanyasi came to him this sanyasi could read the king's mind and as the king again asked him is this the truth or was that the truth he answered maharaj when in that dream he were defeated and exiled and tired and were dying were all these your queen ministers courtiers there with you as jonok said uh, no no one was there i was all alone then the sanyasi said again now tell me uh, when today you were amidst your people with your near and dear ones are the characters or the events from that dream here with you jonok said no they are not here now with me then the sanyasi replied so maharaj 
neither this nor that is the truth now obviously hearing such an answer what comes to our mind instantly uh, then nothing is the truth and jonok simply asked that then again the sanyasi said uh, okay so when in your dream all the evil things were happening to you were you there jonok said of course i was there and then sanyasi said and now uh, when all the good people are around are you here jonok said what kind of a joke is this of course i am here you can see this hence maharaj neither this nor that is the truth instead you are the truth whatever happens to you becomes your truth you see there lies the take away from this story that the truth does not lie outside in fact it is in the form of a story here but you know one of our famous classical scriptures from the field of the upanishads the mandukya upanishad uh, puts forward this theory in one of its shlokas uh, that you do not belong to a truth uh, rather you are the truth you do not belong to this reality or that reality but everything that meets your consciousness becomes your reality the truth you live with it is always in there or in here rather it's always in here like a clean sheet so from this ancient classical sanskrit tale we now move straight to latin and find the word tabula rasa and wow both are the same tabula rasa meaning a cleaned or blank slate often used to depict a human mind which has no innate ideas is the identity of the street here in the fourth prelude the street simply acts as a register you see upon which images are impinged the identity of the street at one level becomes one with that of the woman of the third section words uh, used such as stretched and trampled used in the fourth prelude symbolizes pain and suffering for the street as which is also uh, the daily care of the woman yet at the same time they are different identities as proclaimed in the third section through the line such a vision of the street as the street hardly understands they are like criss crossing each other time and again they are converging and then diverging uh look it might seem a mess if you look at it from a very conventional understanding of what we think to be real we start asking what is then the answer uh, what is the one real truth for the street we always look for a singular answer right but let us understand the modern existence through plurality which uh, we have discussed extensively in our introductory part there is no one singular reality or truth for this age you see remember what adjectives we had used for this age transient fleeting that is the nature of this age moving from one reality to another one truth to another the street embodies this very idea in this section so we come to the final section of the poem a kind of appendix to the fourth part though related to the whole poem broadly uh coming to this section the poem suddenly turns to pity and assumes a religious overtone in the expression a uh, notion of some infinitely gentle infinitely suffering thing momentarily at this point the poetic voice who was speaking in the first two sections prominently speaks again there is a surprising tone of compassion and the infinitely gentle infinitely suffering thing this expression reminds one of the suffering of jesus christ to salvage humanity but alas even this does not stay 
as the conclusive truth of this poem. Immediately, there is a cynical revulsion from all these sentimental fancies. You see in the line, uh, wipe your hand across your mouth and laugh, as if uh, this kind of existence is contemptible. In the concluding image of the poem, the world revolving like ancient women gathering fuel in vacant lots, the utter meaninglessness, the monotony of modern universe is conveyed. In a time that is, that is tormented by crisis, anxiety, personal and political angst, no tale finds a proper ending or vitality to speak the truth. The world order, the individual existence collapse. And what remains? Perhaps as the only lasting element is a deep plight, a pity for the time. So I think this will suffice for the time being just to give you some idea about this poem. Uh, let us see if we have some questions. Uh, so Shreya wants to know uh, the concept of objective correlative in some details. So I think Shreya, uh, uh, you will come to know uh, about this term in greater details when you will be reading uh, the poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Preludes, preludes say, Amra ei kotha ta ke shebhabe ha to khub detail e explore korte pari na. Tobu jeta amra kotha bolte bolte bollam. Je Eliot er dharona erokom chilo je uh, modern age e amra je Existence মধ্যে দিয়ে যাচ্ছি সেগুলো সব সময় যে ইন প্রপার ফ্লেশ এন্ড ব্লাড আমরা ফিল করতে পারি তা নয় হয়তো সেই ইমোশন গুলো সেই অনুভূতি গুলো দে আর ব্রোকেন ডাউন ইনটু সেভারাল ইমেজেস সেভারাল ভিজুয়ালস অর সাউন্ডস অর এনিথিং হয়তো সেই সাউন্ড গুলোকে একসাথে যখন আমি গ্যাদার করি জোড়া লাগাই আমার কাছে একটা ছবি ফুটে ওঠে এবং সেই বিশেষ ছবিটা আমাকে কোনো একটা অনুভূতির আশ্রয় নিয়ে যায় যেমন প্রথম প্রেলিউডে এলিয়ার যখন শহরের বিভিন্ন ছবি তুলে ধরছেন তখন সেই ছবিগুলোকে জোড়া লাগালে আমরা একটা শীতের সন্ধ্যের শহরকে পাই সহজ করে এবং এই শীতের সন্ধ্যের শহরের মধ্যে যে এক ধরনের গ্লুম এক ধরনের নিভে আসা এক ধরনের ডিসঅ্যাপয়েন্টমেন্ট এক ধরনের অপ্রাপ্তি জড়িয়ে থাকে এই অনুভূতিগুলো যখন এই ইমেজের মধ্যে দিয়ে কনভেড হয় সেগুলোকে আমরা অবজেক্টিভ কো রিলেটিভ বলে অবজেক্টিভ হুইচ কো রিলেট ইন অবজেক্টিভলি জিনিসটাকে আমরা কো রিলেট করছি একটা ইমোশনের সাথে বেসিক্যালি তোমার এখানে মনে রাখার মতো শব্দ হচ্ছে কো রিলেটিভ কথাটা ইট ডিলস উইথ দ্য আইডিয়া অফ কো রিলেশন বিটুইন অ্যান ইমোশন অ্যান্ড আ সিরিজ অফ ইমেজেস uh so uh, i think apatoto ei tuku bollei sufficient otherwise i think i will be intruding into someone else's lecture now uh again megha's question was on objective correlative i think i have answered you also uh devanjon has a long uh, observation i think Is it valid to say that Eliot's narrator was perhaps ironical towards his romantic predecessors, the majority of whom were particularly hopeful? Of course, they went on. Of course. Uh, ro romantic age and the modern age are generally believed to be in absolute contradiction. Though uh, there is a famous book by a critic called Aru Kudro, if I'm not wrong, 
বইটার নাম আমি জানি না বইটা এখনো পাওয়া যায় কিনা অ্যাভেলেবল কিনা খুঁজে দেখতে পারো বইটার নাম হচ্ছে মডার্নিজম রোম্যান্টিক জার্নি সো ইটস অ্যাপারেন্টলি কোয়াইট আয়রনিকাল না যে মানে হাউ ক্যান মডার্নিজম বি রোম্যান্টিক তো সেখানে প্রফেসর রুদ্র ক্লেম করছেন যে মডার্নিজমের যে এই সাংঘাতিক ল্যামেন্ট ফর দ্য ল স্টেজ ফর দ্য পাস্ট এজ এটাই যেন একটা রোম্যান্টিক ট্রেন্ড সে নিজের প্রেজেন্টে ইনভলভ না হয়ে যেন পাস্টের যে গ্র্যান্ডার সেটাকে নিয়ে অনেক বেশি ব্যস্ত সেটাকে নিয়ে অনেক বেশি চিন্তিত এবং তাকে নিয়ে তার যত কিছু ল্যামেন্ট সেটা এক ধরনের একটা রোম্যান্টিক অবসেশন হয়ে উঠছে বাট দিস ইজ ওনলি টেক ফ্রম আ ক্রিটিক ব্রডলি মডার্ন এজ অ্যান্ড অ্যাজ ইউ হ্যাভ রাইটলি পয়েন্টেড আউট দ্যাট এলিয়ার্স ন্যারেটার is definitely ironical towards his romantic predecessors right uh, another question uh, from megha in the ending lines reference to suffering of jesus christ uh eliot uh, wanted some divine soul right but সেটা প্রেলিউডস এর ক্ষেত্রে আমরা একেবারে সার্টেনলি হয়তো বলতে পারি না ইনফ্যাক্ট যত এলিয়টের কবিতায় এগোতে থাকবে প্রেলিউড একেবারে শুরুর কবিতা এলিয়টের বুঝতে পারছো সেখানে উনি একটা পসিবিলিটি দেখাচ্ছেন যে আমাদের কাছে কি স্যালভেশনের স্কোপ আছে আমাদের যে এই সাংঘাতিক একটা র্যাব মান্ডেন ফ্রাস্ট্রেটিং রিয়েলিটি এখান থেকে কি সত্যি আমরা বেরোতে পারি কখনো এবং বেরোনোর জন্য কি আমাদের সেই ঈশ্বরের দিকেই তাকাতে হবে তার কাছেই স্মরণাপন্ন হতে হবে এই প্রশ্নগুলো তুলছেন কিন্তু এই সময় তার নিজেরও সেই বিশ্বাস নেই যে জন্য তিনি এটাতে স্টিক করে থাকতে পারছেন না ওই ফাইনালি গিয়ে একটা রিভলশন চলে আসছেন তার মনে হচ্ছে এগুলো খুব সেন্টিমেন্টাল কিছু চিন্তা ভাবনা কিন্তু তুমি যত এলিয়টের পরের দিকের কবিতায় যাবে আহ ওয়েস্টল্যান্ড ওয়েস্টল্যান্ড নামটাই যেরকম মানে সে একটা পুরো ভেঙে যাওয়া সমাজ চিত্রকে তুলে ধরছে ওয়ার্ল্ড ওয়ারের পর অথচ সেই ওয়েস্টল্যান্ডই যখন বিরাট বড় কবিতা গিয়ে ফাইনালি শেষ হচ্ছে শেষ হচ্ছে কিসে ভগবদ গীতার কথায় অর্থাৎ এলিয়ট শুধুমাত্র ক্রিশ্চিয়ানিটি নন উনি আস্তে আস্তে প্রাচ্যের দিকে আসছেন এই স্পিরিচুয়ালিটি এই ঈশ্বরে বিশ্বাস এর সন্ধানে হলো মেনে যাও একই কথা অ্যাশওয়েডনেস ডেতে যাও ঈশ্বরের ওপর বিশ্বাস রিলিজিয়নের ওপর বিশ্বাস এলিয়টের আরো স্ট্রং হচ্ছে উনি আস্তে আস্তে নিজের যে সো কলড কোট আন কোট এথেইস্ট ফেস সেটার থেকে মুখ ঘুরিয়ে নিচ্ছেন স্পিরিচুয়ালিটির দিকে একটা রিলিজিয়াস ট্রান্সেন্ডেন্স জার্নির দিকে এটাই যখন তুমি মেরিনা অ্যান্ড আদার এরিয়াল পোয়েমস এ যাবে আরো প্রকট হবে অ্যান্ড ফাইনালি ইন দ্য ফোর কোয়ার্টার্স এটা গিয়ে মানে ইট বিকামস এ রিলিজিয়াস পোয়েম অল টুগেদার so i think um, prelude sir khetre yes he did try to envision a solution to all these problems and he tried to seek help from uh, religion but he failed in his attempts we must say uh, so is there any other question there is again from shreya there is an imposition of life on the street a separate entity does this aim to conjecture in the fragmentation of the soul yes it does because rastar kono ekta identity ekhane prominent hoy na rastar opor diye jarai hete jacche tarai orokom in bits and pieces you see uh, uh, like chok hat newspaper dhore ache keu এইগুলোই তার আইডেন্টিটি হিসেবে কাউন্টেড হচ্ছে এবং এটাই মডার্ন এজ এর যে স্প্লিট পার্সোনালিটি মাল্টিপল প্লুরাল আইডেন্টিটি এটাকে এক্সপ্লেন করে কিছুটা if if we really think of an end um, which resolves the crisis which finds a solution to our problems chekhetre amader chinta bhavna gulo shei dike move korte thake kintu eliot nijer kobitar sheshe 
আই ডোন্ট থিঙ্ক হি ইজ এবল টু ফাইন্ড আ সলিউশন রাদার দ্য মনোটনি যেটা শুরু থেকেই উনি বলে চলেছিলেন এই কবিতার সেকশন গুলোর মধ্যে দিয়ে সেটা আরো বেশি করে ওকে গ্রাস করছে এবং এই কথাটার মধ্যে দিয়ে যে ঠিক যেভাবে দিজ পিটিএবল উইমেন দে কিপ গ্যাদারিং ফিউল ইন ভ্যাকেন্ট লটস অ্যান্ড দ্য ওয়ার্ল্ড রিভলভস লাইক দ্যাট এর মধ্যে কোনো চেঞ্জ নেই দ্য মান্ডেন আইডিয়া সেইটা চলে আসে এর মধ্যে কিছুটা uh joy misro does eliot indicate plato's idea of ideal state no uh, not in this poem i think plato's idea of ideal state has something else to do with uh, which is beyond uh, the scope of this class i don't think uh, uh, i can read it in this way joy uh a question from onunna mm. he answers without sense of fear being ashamed but why there is a sense of shame while this reading is very twisty i think the sense of shame comes from your awareness of the previous age of the glory that you associated with the previous age if you are already a pauper if you are already a beggar you have nothing to lose you see so had victorian age suffered a deep setback the modern age would have nothing to lose but as uh, the victorian age flaunted itself like uh, a high moral entity uh, proud of its racial identity its imperial identity and then all of a sudden in the first decade of the 20th century these things were falling apart into pieces all these meant absolutely nothing so uh, for a rational intellectual modern man uh, it was a matter of shame and therefore whatever elier describes uh, in his preludes or uh, maybe in some other lecture on proof rock you will find some other references as well there is a there is an innate idea of shame that comes uh, with his description so thank you very much for this question it was important uh living and partly living in case of partly are we not living our full fledged identity uh, this this expression is from uh, the murder in the cathedral uh, and you need to see the context here jekhane dekha jacche chorus jara ar ki tara opekkha korche beket ke ekhan diye niye jawa hobe ebong tara bolchen je eto din amra ei ashay beche chilam je amader beket achen so uh, we are living somehow আমাদের বেঁচে থাকা বেঁচে থাকাটাকে সম্পূর্ণ ভাবে বেঁচে থাকা আমরা বলতে পারি না বাট ইয়েস উই আর লিভিং পার্টলি ইন হোপ সো আমি মনে করি না মার্ডার ইন দ্য ক্যাথেড্রাল এই স্টেটমেন্টের সঙ্গে প্রেলিউডসকে ডিরেক্টলি রিলেট করা যায় কারণ মার্ডার ইন দ্য ক্যাথেড্রাল হ্যাজ এ ভেরি ডিপ রিলিজিয়াস স্টোন ইন ইট তবে হ্যাঁ মানে ডেফিনেটলি ইট ইজ নট অ্যাবাউট লিভিং ইউর ফুল ফ্লেজ এ ডাইভিং Uh, so i think uh, these were the questions uh, that were asked uh, so thank you again my students for listening to the presentation to the session uh, and now over to the organizers thank you thank you very much thank you thank you professor roy choudhury uh, i think that this is this is uh, somehow difficult to complete the entire text of prelude in just one class and certainly you have done a commendable job and our student and the other students from various colleges would definitely uh benefit uh, from your lecture too and some of the questions uh, from the chat box are coming like uh, please provide the youtube link or like that uh for those students i would like to say that the whole lecture has been already recorded and it would be provided on the google classroom right there is no youtube link it will it has already recorded and it will be provided on the google classroom so thank you to the student and thank you to our speaker professor roy choudhury uh, so that's it for sir. this session thank you.